Mic check one, two, three, four, five. Probably should have worn an outfit with a belt. Thanks. on the tire of the lapel. How are you? I do want to be respectful and ask how you would like to be called. Representative. Joe Cunningham? Joe Cunningham? How yeah. should be called? Joe Cunningham, sorry. Actually, just call me Katie. Just call me Katie. Joe? Call me Katie. Just, call. just as long as you call it Dean. Anybody feels like they're about to have some uh, crampage in their legs, stand up, stretch them out.
All right, so you want to have... I did. It's your voice, your future. Tonight, live from the campus of Charleston Southern University, it's the 2018 Congressional Debate for South Carolina's 1st District. Brought to you by ABC News 4 and Charleston Southern University. Please welcome tonight's moderator, Dean Stevens. Middleton, Drayton, Pinckney, Legree. The history of the 1st Congressional District in South Carolina runs deep and in three weeks either representative katie errington or joe cunningham will add their name to the ledger that also includes mark sanford tim scott henry brown and mendel rivers good evening everybody i'm dean stevens and we thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to the campus of charleston southern university that first district also runs along about 80 percent of our coastline from hilton head to charleston county it includes five counties, Charleston, Dorchester, Beaufort, Berkeley, and Colleton as well. As for tonight's debate, both Ms. Arrington and Mr. Cunningham have agreed on the debate format, and we'd like to go over those rules quickly with you. The candidates will not give an opening statement. Each candidate will have just one minute to respond to each question asked. Each candidate will also be allowed to use three rebuttals, which can be used at any time. Those rebuttals will be limited to 30 seconds. The candidates are not allowed to ask questions of each other, and they will have one minute for closing statements. As for our three panelists tonight asking those questions, we'd like to first introduce Christy Gramling, an assistant professor of political science here at Charleston Southern University. Charleston Southern senior, Diana Snellgrove. She is a history and political science major who will graduate 
next spring. And finally, Tessa Spencer Adams. She has spent 28 years in the broadcast industry and has worked the last seven years at ABC News 4 and Good Morning Charleston. Thank you all for being here tonight and agreeing to be a part of this debate. In the interest of time during tonight's debate, we've asked our live audience to refrain from clapping, cheering, or making noise. There are now three exceptions to the rule. One is when we introduce them. Uh, your applause will be welcome at the conclusion of tonight's debate. Your applause is also welcome right now as we welcome our candidates in alphabetical order. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our state representative, Katie Arrington and Joe Cunningham. And with that, it's time to begin our debate. The order of the responses determined before the debate by a random draw. Mr. Cunningham, the first question will go to you and will be asked by Professor Gramling. Good evening. If elected, what would be the first law you would propose in Congress? Well, thank you, Charleston Southern. Thank you, Channel 4. Thank you, Dean Stevens. Thank you, Katie Arrington, for being here. If elected to Congress, I think it's important we bring back the ban on offshore drilling. I think it's important for people to realize that there was a ban on offshore drilling put together by Republican mayors, Democratic mayors, independent mayors. That ban was lifted by this administration. My opponent supported the lifting of that ban. I couldn't have opposed it more strenuously. I think our beaches, our coastlines, our waterways are our pride and joy here in the first district and I will fight like hell to protect them. As your congressman, that would be one of the first orders of business that I will do to protect the low country here. Representative Arrington. Thank you all, and thank you so much for doing this tonight. I appreciate it, it's a weeknight and your time. And everyone in the audience, thank you. So, I'm not for drilling off the coast of South Carolina, but the only person that can give an exemption to that is the President of the United States. I have clearly had a meeting with him regarding this, the Vice President and senior administration officials to ensure that we have an exemption. But understand, I will have a seat at the table. Mr. Cunningham wrote a letter that no one will read for the next two years. But the first law that I would pass would be about infrastructure. We need to bring our tax dollars back to the low country to build roads, to build bridges, and to fix our storm drain system that has been disrepair for over 50 years. Our dollars have been going to Washington, and that is something everyone in this district is going to feel. From Dorchester County all the way to Colleton, Charleston, Berkeley, Beaufort, we all feel the need for infrastructure. The first thing I'll do is bring our infrastructure dollars back home. Rebuttal. Okay. Representative Arrington, the next question will be asked by Diana Snowgrove. Good evening. Hi. Uh, many students on this campus are concerned about gun violence. How do you, uh, how do we prevent school shootings while also protecting people's Second Amendment rights? So, first and foremost, this nation's greatest asset are our children and our youth, and we have to do everything we can to protect them. That's why, while I've been getting ready for this uh, election, I've been working. Um, last year, the government, uh, Congress, and President Trump passed the Stop School Violence Act. That provides money, our federal dollars that are in Washington, back to the states to apply for grants. There's a company right here in South Carolina in North Charleston that creates bulletproof doors. I'm working with school districts to write up a grant for them to submit to get the money to protect the children in the schoolrooms with bulletproof doors and also to provide additional physical security, SRO officers, on the school grounds every single day. The first thing we need to do is protect the children. And I will always stand unequivocally to protect your Second Amendment rights. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham? I support the Second Amendment. I'm a gun owner. I have my concealed weapons permit. There's not enough legislation to cure all the ills of our society. We need personal responsibility to make sure we keep guns out of the hands of children and the people who shouldn't have them. But I think we should also have some common sense gun safety legislation. I think we should also have comprehensive background checks. I don't see the need for 
bump stocks, which turn semi-automatic weapons into automatic weapons. My opponent supports bump stocks. And I am proud to say that I can go up and fight for the Second Amendment and also fight for common sense legislation. Because unlike my opponent, I'm not being funded by special interest or PACs or the NRA. All my money is coming through individuals. And that's who I'm going to serve. Can I rebuttal? Yes, you may. Ladies and seconds. gentlemen, oh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly why I have an A rating from the NRA and my opponent has an F rating. If we start touching the Second Amendment, what other amendments can they go after? Your right to free speech? We have to protect those. We need to ensure that government does what we've already tasked them to do, which they failed most recently, South Carolina and Texas. Government is failing their job already. Why would we tax them to do more? The next question from Tessa Spencer Adams. Good evening. Many people believe we have a mental health crisis in this country, in our country. What can be done by the federal government to address the crisis? Yeah, our, our health care crisis is widespread and it goes from mental health care everywhere. And everyone in South Carolina should have access to affordable and quality health care. And right now, they don't. You know, I think back to when my wife was pregnant with Boone and she got a fever. And we we're concerned about taking her in because we we're thinking about the price and how much it would cost. And each one at home has a similar story to how health care costs have prevented you from seeking health care. And that's just wrong. It's important to remember that, you know, the ACA wasn't perfect. But I think we should keep with what works throw out what doesn't, and come together, Republicans and Democrats, and fix every single thing else. My opponent wants to go back to the days where we discriminate against people because of pre-existing conditions. And I think that's wrong. I think that's un-American. That's your time. Thank you. So, Representative Erickson? <laughs> Once again, Mr. Cunningham, you're wrong. I'm actually a pre-existing condition. I'm a walking breast cancer survivor. So I am absolutely going to ensure that we maintain that, that good thing that came out of the Obamacare Act. The rest, not so much. But let's answer the question about mental health. We have a mental health crisis in this country, number one, because we do not value the employer, the, the doctors and the clinicians. We need to do more to support them to help our, each other. We need to work on getting insurance plans to the people that are out there that can get good he mental health care. Telehealth is an amazing new advancement that we have. We need to do more to support that. When people are in crisis, we need to work in a government. It's our job to ensure that we give them the tools to survive. We have people in this country who are sitting in hospital beds because of Obamacare for hours and days waiting for care. That is unacceptable, and that is what I'm going to Washington to fix. I could respond. Yes, you may. Uh, once again, Representative Arrington, your record does not match the rhetoric. You support a bill that would rip health care away from thousands of people right here in the low country. You support a bill that would go back to discriminate against people based upon their pre existing conditions. So sit here and suggest otherwise, I think, is being dishonest with the voters here in the low country. Professor Gramling, question for Representative Arrington. The partisan divide feels wider and deeper than it ever has before. How would your character, behavior, and choices in Congress mend that divide? Well, thank you. It's a great question. Lead by example. Number one, this has turned into a, you know, the, the whisper campaign because I didn't bring out the fact that I had breast cancer out publicly. A whisper campaign went around Charleston that I was lying about it. Then the worst thing that happened, I had nine African-American Democrats endorse me. And what came out was a picture of them being lynched with me standing there in, in Southern gal regalia. That is exactly the problem with Nancy Pelosi and the DC Democrats, that kind of division. I'll lead by example. When these things were said about me recently, I took it on the chin. I do think it's a battle of good and evil when you have people that are willing to lie about others. I think that when you threaten to take and intimidate someone and take their basic rights away of free speech, that's evil. That is something I would never do. I mean, I think this political tribalism right now is tearing our country apart at its moral fabric. You know, it's pitting 
neighbor against neighbor, husband against wife, brother against sister. And it's manifesting itself because of comments like what Representative Arrington said on the radio, that this campaign is about good and evil. I don't think so. I think it's a matter of a spirited debate between issues. But I think when you put that kind of rhetoric out, you drive a wedge in between people. And I don't know how you can say you're going up to Congress to represent everyone when you're classifying some people as good and other people as evil. You're classifying people as evil that you served with in the State House. Mayor Riley's a Democrat. Representative David Mack. Representative Leon Stavernakis. Do you think those people are evil as well? I think it's that kind of rhetoric that is destroying our country. And it's that kind of rhetoric that she wants to bring to D.C. It's the kind of rhetoric I want, I want to extinguish. Can I use my rebuttal? Yes, you may. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Cunningham is trying to paint a picture. But let me be clear. When you don't come out, when that came out, the picture, the meme of, of the people being lynched, he didn't condemn it. He didn't condemn it when the rumor went around that I was faking breast cancer. He didn't condemn it. And in fact, he wouldn't even condemn Archie Parnell in his uh, wife abuse, spouse abuse. We're talking, this is the problem, not Time owning is, your mistakes. Time is up. Diana, a question for Joe Cunningham. Yes. Uh, students are worried about racking up college debt and then not being able to pay it off for decades to come. What are your plans for making education more affordable? Listen, uh, college edu education should be affordable. You know, I'm, I'm happy to have my degree in ocean engineering and also my law degree. But my wife and I pay the equivalent of a mortgage in student loan debt every single month. And I'm sure many people at home feel exactly the same way, that they can't get ahead because they're paying so much in student loan debt. And right now, you can only write off your student debt interest. And I think you should be able to write off more. I think we should control the cost of higher education. I think it's gotten out of control and it's pushed the American dream for so many young students out of reach. They're living with their parents right now because they can't afford a down payment because most of their money goes into that closed loop system of student loan debt. And I'm there with you. And I understand the problem. I think that controlling the cost and also being able to write off more of your debt would help students get ahead. Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, what are your plans for making education more affordable? So first and foremost, in education is an investment in you. So we have to show you the return on investment. That's what's important here. I don't have a college degree. I started, I, I went through a lot of different schools, but I was never able to culminate into a degree. It doesn't mean that I'm any more or less valuable than anyone else in this community. What government's job is to do is to cut ta taxes so that there are more jobs for the young that are coming out of school to go into, to earn the money to pay back the debt, because it is a return on investment. But then think about it. If we were to go and, and say everybody gets current blood, what about all of those people that have turmoiled and worked so hard to get an education? We need to be able to provide jobs for people to earn a good living so that they can pay off their debt, but we can't discount the fact that there are many people who just aren't going to go to college. There's nothing wrong with technical schools. There's nothing wrong with trades, and we need to have an even open advancement for all, not just those who go for four-year degrees. Thank you. Tessa, a question to Ms. Arrington. What have you done during your campaign to gain support from minorities in the Lowcountry? Well, you know, I'll use my endorsement of the nine African American leaders. Um, I went directly to them, I spoke to them, and why they endorsed me was that they knew I was going to work hard to lower taxes, to create jobs, and provide safer communities for us to live in. Isn't that what we all want? It shouldn't be based on anybody's race, color, religion. It should be about what we can do to make our community better. I will work hard to make sure that the tax, come, tax cuts become permanent because those small business owners and middle class Americans that have gotten $3,000 back this year can be able to better prepare for that. Communities see that. They want that. That's something that I, I'm proudly proud of and I've worked for in my campaign. People need to be healthy and they need to be educated. Those are the two core building blocks. And right now, people are being left behind on health care and education. We want to drive down the cost of health care. We want to increase the level of education. And all that applies to the African-American community here in the first district. 
And I'm proud Miss Arrington has received uh, the endorsement from nine African American business leaders. And I'll cede the rest of my time for her so she can name those for us because I haven't met them yet. Oh, do we, Maurice Washington, Jerome, why do you want me to continue? Yeah, on? go ahead, too. That's two. I, Mr. Cunningham, I don't understand the point. I'm of this. just saying. We're gonna I'm, go sorry, ahead and, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this I'm right sorry. now, um, it, so no questions would be asked from one opponent to a next. Can I rebuttal? Um, you they, may. I would, ladies and gentlemen, be more than happy to provide those nine names. But since it was made public that they did it, they have been threatened. Some of them have lost their jobs. I don't feel comfortable doing that because this community and the rhetoric that's come out of it has made it unsafe for these people to have their names out there. That's what I mean by evil. When you put a picture up of someone being lynched. Representative Arrington, thank you. Professor Gramling, you have a question for Mr. Cunningham. Yes. Um, for Mr. Cunningham, where would you support the president's policies? And then for Representative Arrington, is there a line in the sand you won't cross when it comes to supporting the president's policies? Yeah, President Trump came out and spoke about a bill for infrastructure. I think that's a huge concern. At 6 p.m. every night, I want to be home because that's when I give my son a bath. And sometimes that's the only quality time I have with him. I put my phone in the other room and it's just him and I. If I'm home at 6.30, 7, 7.30, that's taken away from me. Each of you all at home have something different that you want to make it to. Maybe it's a, your daughter's softball game. But if we're stuck in infrastructure, if we're stuck in traffic, that's the tax of time that we're paying because government cannot fulfill its basic responsibility. And I think that the reason they, they can't fulfill that responsibility is because there's so much divisiveness. Nobody can work together. And Katie Arrington has been very clear. She's been unable to work with anybody in the State House. She'll be unable to work with anybody in Congress. I will. I've got bipartisan support, Republican mayor endorsements, and obvious that I can work across the aisle. Representative Arrington. So once again, Mr. Cunningham, you're wrong again. I worked across the aisle in the State House, and I was able to pass legislation that had been bounced around for 20-something years because I went across the aisle. I have no problem. I think that in going the promise that not every Democrat is always wrong, nor is every Republican always right. But where I can tell you is when I disagree with the president on anything, I'll go to him and I'll tell him directly. I told him that recently in the White House, inside the Oval Office, on an issue. Tariffs. I don't agree with everything that's being done. But I have the respect of the President of the United States to have that conversation. And I'll have a seat at the table, unlike Mr. Cunningham. So who do you want more in the next two years representing you? Someone who's going to be at the table, or do you want someone who's going to be on the menu? Let me just use a rebuttal there. Um, the problem is, again, your record doesn't match your rhetoric. You went on Breitbart Radio and said you wanted to be the Kellyanne Conway of Congress. You spent your whole primary attacking Congressman Sanford because he stood up to President Trump. You refused to stand up to President Trump when he lifted the ban on offshore drilling. You refused to stand up to President Trump whenever he imposed these tariffs that are killing jobs here in Low Country. You're incapable of doing that. You will not do it, and the people here in Low Country know that. Next question from Tessa Spencer Adams to Representative Arrington. Uh, this one comes uh, from social media on Twitter. Do you agree with repealing Obamacare? And if so, what solution do you support for improving health care? 100%. The career politicians in Washington has failed us. We have to repeal and replace Obamacare. Take along a few things that we learned with it, pre-existing conditions, things one. But the first thing we need to do is to empower small businesses. What Obamacare did to small businesses broke this nation. Small businesses' greatest asset is their employees, and they mandated that if there was an, a 40-hour employee, as my husband and I are small business owners, we had to offer health care, which we did anyway. But it cost so many others that they had to bring their employees down to 25 or 30 hours. First thing, we need to incentivize small business to be able to provide good quality health care to their best asset. Next, we need to be able to cause transparency in billing so that we get our true money, our value at. We have misbilling, misdiagnoses, overbilling, fraud, waste, and abuse. We need to take care of that. But my final thing will be, why don't you, the American citizen, own your health care record? 
think if you owned it, not the hospitals, not the doctors, how you could eliminate many misdiagnoses and expenditure costs with healthcare. Mr. Cunningham? Yeah, let me just start off by saying uh, we recognize there are going to be some inconsistencies with my opponent's position. So we set up a website called JoeCunninghamFacts.com where you can go on real time and check the facts. Um, we're trying to keep up real time, but it also depends on how fast my opponent speaks. Um, the bill you supported, though, Katie, would go back to the age of discriminating against people with pre existing conditions, whether they had diabetes or cancer. Any type of pre existing condition, their rates would go up. And the bill you supported also imposed a senior's tax. Listen, I think we can drive down the cost of health care with common sense solutions. But it's going to take Democrats and Republicans coming get together. I think Medicare should be able to negotiate the price of prescription drugs, similar to how the VA does. But you're only going to get to these solutions, these common sense solutions, if you send people who can work across the aisle. And my opponent can't. I will. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Let's go to um, Ms. Snellgrove. I apologize, I skipped over you. So you get a question here for Mr. Cunningham. Uh, one of my loved ones has been personally affected by the opioid I crisis didn't, here. I didn't get the answer to that one. My apologies. <laughs> Go ahead, Katie. I'm sorry. Oh, can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Um, one of my loved ones has been no, personally affected. No, this would come. Go affected. back to your original question. Or, sorry. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. You're right. Okay. Sorry. Great. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Diana. Um, my loved one has a chronic illness, and this makes it difficult to get the medication they need. Um, so would you have any modifications to the current opioid laws? Just for you, yes, yes. Yeah. The opioid crisis is uh, it's an epidemic in this country. Uh, I was out in uh, Allendale Greens, uh, Eddie White puts on every week, and I met a gentleman whose son passed away because he's addicted to opioids. And he told me his son was number 168 in the state. Uh, Charleston County now leads the state in opioid overdoses. I think Big Pharma has gotten too much control in our healthcare system, and I think they need to be kicked out of the driver's seat. They shouldn't be there dictating the prices of pharmaceuticals and also uh, by controlling the, controlling the market with opioids. And that's why we're not taking a single dime from special interest or PAC dollars. My opponent is being fueled by PAC dollars. Big Pharma, big oil, no. payday no. lenders, that's who's controlling her campaign. I'm going to be able to stand up to Big Pharma because I'm not taking their money. My opponent is beholden to them. Well, once again, Mr. Cunningham, the fact you take Nancy Pelosi's laundered money, we'll just let that one be. But the question was about opioids. I have firsthand experience, unlike Mr. Cunningham, that he's got to go meet people. It's been my life. Everything in my life has brought me to this point. My mother passed away in this uh, campaign cycle chronic pain. She was addicted to opioids for the bulk share of her, her adult life. And I watched it take my mother from a vital human being to a withered human being. I sat on the South Carolina task force for two years. I wasn't on it, I just went to the meetings and I heard from our community. And what we need to do is ensure that the people that are actually being picked up for opioid addiction, get treatment. They don't get conviction, that's imperative. But we need to ensure that they have the beds to get treatment at, that's what government should do. But on the other side, we make sure that the drug dealers and the people bringing those narcotics into our communities are held to the highest uh, penalties that law can imagine. That's your time, thank you. Thank you. We're gonna come back down this way, Tess, if that's okay with you, for a question for Katie Arrington. Um, what will you do to help fund FEMA to help flood victims? Awesome question, thank you so much. FEMA, it's necessary. So over this election cycle, instead of going on brewery tours, I actually went to the communities. I went to people and I had flood solution roundtables because it's imperative that we hear from the people directly what's going on. I compiled the information together. And along with what we found out in Turkey Creek or Church Creek Basin or the family in Ladson that's flooded three times, FEMA is not giving the money to mitigate the flood to homeowners. So they're just bringing their homes back to pre-existing condition. We need to be able to mitigate the floods. 
My job when I go to Congress is to ensure that the people in this district have the resources they can get through to run through all the bureaucratic red tape the career politicians in Washington have created. So my solution is I'll be offering one person from the staff full time located here in the Low Country, and their job is to do nothing more than assist the community with the floods that happen, FEMA applications, and ensure that their taxpayers get their best dollar value out of their tax dollar. All right, Tessa, with, uh, hold on, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joe. It's that flooding's a huge issue here. I mean, most of us know that, you know, high tide, you can't take East Bay Street, and, you know, on heavy rain, you can't take the Crosstown. So we're seeing it more and more frequently. And I was meeting with Mayor Tecklenburg earlier this week, and we talked about the Corps of Engineers study that's being done, and then the solutions that can come about that. But you can only go up there and get that money if you're able to work across the aisle and work with each other. Democrats, Republicans, and independents. You know, Katie Arrington said the job of a Republican congressperson is to fight for their team. I think the job is to represent you here in the low country. And the question to be asked is, if she didn't do anything about it at the state house about flooding, why would you expect her to go to Congress and do something? I think that answer is pretty clear. We're not going to get anything done for the first district until we start working together. All right, we will go to uh, Professor Gramling with our question for Joe Cunningham, please. The South Carolina coast is worth nearly $9 billion in tourism and almost 100,000 jobs. Additionally, with the recent discovery of a coral reef off the coast of Charleston, what will you do to protect the South Carolina coast? Offshore drilling. Ban offshore drilling once and for all. Bring that ban back. And we talked about that a little bit earlier, how my opponent supported lifting the ban on offshore drilling. And she won't sit here and explain to you why she supported lifting the ban. It just shows poor judgment, really. If you lift a ban on smoking inside a restaurant, what do you expect to happen? People will start smoking. If you left a ban on offshore drilling off our coast, people are going to start drilling. Republican mayors have crossed over the aisle, Republican council members, to endorse my campaign because they realize I'm the only one who can be trusted on this issue. I'm the only one they can count on to defend our beaches, our coastal waterways, and our environment. So first and foremost, let's, let's go back to, I'm not for offshore drilling off the coast of South Carolina. I'm working with a policy for the President of the United States to sign but we're talking about protecting our coastline. So what have I been doing in, uh, during the campaign season? I'm part of the American Flood Coalition, which is a group that is, has come along and they realize our coastlines are at risk. We're, the money came down from FEMA, a HUD grant for flood mitigation to the state of South Carolina, $157 million. All we're asking for is $30 million to build a seawall to protect our most vulnerable hospital district. MUSC, Roper, and the VA. So that during flooding events like Florence, people can get to the level one trauma center and they can get to the VA to get their benefits they so deserve. And people can move around the hospital district. That's thing one. Working to protect our coast to ensure that the beach renourishment maintains. That's something that's imperative. We have to have a breaker out there so that the water doesn't erode our beach erosion. Thank you. I'd like to use a rebuttal there. Yes. I'm not sure why she dodged the issue of offshore drilling, but I'd go to Matthew 6, verse 21, which says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I ask you to take a look at where Katie Arrington's treasure is, because her money is coming from PACs, special interests, almost $200,000. Big oil, big pharma. Her own campaign treasurer is, was a lobbyist for 15 years for BP oil. I think that says it all. That is all the rebuttals for <clears throat> both candidates mm -hmm. for the next 30 minutes. All right, question 11 to Diana, to Ms. Arrington. Right. In the last few years alone, South Carolina has dealt with multiple flooding events. Yes. What will you do to fix the flooding in this area? Well, as I stated earlier, I've been conducting flat flood solution roundtables and going to our communities and finding out what we need. One of the bigger issues we have is what goes up must come down. We need our storm drain systems, A, to be maintained, B, to be cleaned, and C, to be upsized. Because when it rains upstate, 
and it comes to drain into the harbor at high tide, backflow happens and flooding happens. So we need someone who's gonna go up to Washington, has laser focus to get the money back into districts so that we can fix those problems. Secondly, as I said, I'll have someone in district who's going to be the point of, of uh, connection for the community, for the state, for the federal, for the local level, to ensure that when we need something done, like cleaning out storm drains, it's not as easy as you would think. If there's a navigable waterway, you have to get a permit for the Army Corps of Engineers. There's a litany of things that need to do, but we need someone located to be the, the point of concern for everyone in this community, and I'm gonna have that in district. Mr. Cunningham? I think you need to be able to work with state and local officials in addressing flooding, but I think it's also important that you believe in climate change, and you believe that flooding, the hurricanes, are happening at more intense frequency. I'm the only one up here who actually believes in climate change and believes in science. I think you have to have that foundation first. And I don't think that putting an intern on the issue okay. is going to be good enough. It's about going up to Washington, D.C., reaching across the aisle, working with Democrats, Republicans, independents, and come forward with solutions, and standing up for the values here in the low country, even if it means standing up to your own party. And now I'm the only one here that will do that. All right. Thank you. Christy, we'll come back to you for a question for Mr. Cunningham. Uh, growth is broom booming. Traffic is at a standstill. What will you do to ensure South Carolina will get the federal dollars needed to deal with the infrastructure? If you're sitting in traffic, like I said, that's a tax you're paying because government has not fulfilled their most basic function. I-26, 526 is a joke. Based on how we've grown, we're, we're a low country of 2018 and we're confined by the infrastructures of the 1960s and it needs a change. But you can go, only go out there and get those federal dollars for those projects, 26, 526. We need flyovers from 17 onto Main Road. We need to relocate utilities. All these dollars can only be received if you go up there and work with others on a strong infrastructure package and be able to work with people across the, across the aisle, which I've been proven to do. We've got endorsements here. My opponent hasn't done anything at the State House besides raise your taxes. That's all she's done here. I'm willing to work with others to get results for the low country. So I appreciate Mr. Cunningham keep trying to you know, convince everyone I can't work across the aisle. Just because you say it doesn't make it real. I worked hard to make infrastructure the key platform in my state house race. And in the time I was in the state house, I worked across the aisles to ensure that we got our infrastructure dollars back in district and that we took care <clears throat> of the problems that we had. But when we talk about our traffic and how congested it is, and yes, government, the development is overblown, but we need to have someone who understands how government works to go up and get the money for the federal dollars, to add lanes to 26, to build a bridge over from Daniel Island instead of one. The port is a huge source of our income for economy in this state, and we have to ensure that we have that. Understanding the process is something that I get. I get how to get the money back. No one wants to sit in traffic, least of all me. I have grandchildren, I have a husband and a family to get home to, just like you. The next question will be asked by Diana to Ms. Arrington. Okay. Uh, do you support the legalization of marijuana, either medically or regulationally? So I worked hard in the State House on this issue specifically, and I do understand the challenges with SLED and the, the laws. I do support medicinal marijuana. I think that the FDA and the career politicians have let that drag on too long. I, that is something that should be a Schedule II narcotic. My mother, God rest her soul, because I had to give her morphine when she was in incredible pain dying of COPD instead of medicinal marijuana or cannabis. She suffered tremendously and slept. I've watched epileptic children come before my committee at 3 on 3M in the State House, who their only way to get through the day is through medicinal marijuana. I will work hard to ensure that we keep our promise to our community on that, but also respecting the law. It should become a Schedule II narcotic, and we should ensure that our law enforcement has the tools that they need to protect our communities. We had a uh, veterans roundtable 
in Mount Pleasant last week and one of the veterans there was talking about how he went in to get treated and they just prescribed opioids and got addicted to Oxycontin. Whenever sometimes medicinal marijuana would have sufficed. I think medical marijuana should be legal. I'm not sure it should be a Schedule II, the same level as Oxycontin. I don't view it as that strong, but I think it should be legal. As it relates to recreational marijuana, I think that should be left up to the states to decide. I think the federal government becomes too involved in our lives sometimes. And I think that should be a state issue determined on a state level. Tessa, question to Mr. Cunningham. It's been reported that contraband cell phones contributed to seven inmate deaths at Lee Correctional Institution during a riot. Where do you stand on the FCC installing cell phone jamming technology in our prisons? I worked in the prosecutor's office uh, for a number of years prosecuting felons and I understand the, the risk they're involved uh, with correctional officers, law enforcement, and how they put their lives on the line every single day. And any measure that can be put in place that might be able to damper uh, those risks, I would be more than willing to consider it. it. It's wrong for cell phones to be inside prisons. It shouldn't be there. And I think if there's ways to eliminate that risk, we should consider those as well. But I always stand on the side of law enforcement. I've worked with them, worked alongside them. I've been inside grand jury rooms with them, presenting evidence and solving cases with them. And I'll continue to do that in Congress. Prior to becoming a legislator, um, I'm a subject matter expert on cybersecurity for the Department of Defense, in specific, disruptive technologies. Um, I actually worked with uh, Brian Sterling to get some jamming uh, technology into South Carolina. Um, there's some up in uh, Maryland, I believe, on a, a pilot basis right now. The reason that I did that is because, you know, you, I'm sure you all know, the five sheriffs of this community endorsed me because they understand I know the challenges that they face every day. We absolutely can, we can jam the cell phones, without a doubt. People in prison have broken the law. They should not have the rights to use cell phones at their will. It's a controlled environment, and we need to ensure that our law enforcement officers who put their lives on the line every day, our correctional officers, are protected. And people in prisons with phones are doing bad things, and it needs to stop. Professor Gramling, a question for Katie Arrington. How would you reform immigration laws? So first of all, build the wall. We need to do that. Secondarily, I've spent a lot of time with the farmers and uh, home builders in the area. We need to reform our migrant worker visas. It's a simple process that we can create. It's just Congress and the career politicians in Washington have made it a challenge. Why can't people that want to come work in this country as a migrant worker buy a six-month visa? get a 15-digit number and a cloud-based system, and each of the farmers put it in. They put the digits in, we're able to verify who the person is, we'll be able to get taxes from them and provide them services for it. At the end of the six months, they can pay another fee to stay on. We need to in clean up the H-1 visa program. Congress has been kicking this can down the road for far too long, and we need someone in Washington to get it done. There's a lot to be done, but we need to protect our country first and foremost. Nothing is more important to me than keeping your family safe, keeping my family safe. We're a nation of immigrants, but we're also a nation of laws. And we need tough, smart border security. Not border security that just looks tough, but is tough. You know, we built walls in the 1500s because that's the only technology we have. Now we have highly trained border, border personnel. We have uh, drones. We have satellite imagery. We can control the border at a fraction of the cost. I don't think we need to be spending billions of dollars on a wall. I'd rather spend those billions of dollars here in the low country building our infrastructure whether it be our roads or fixing our flooding, fixing issues here in the low country. That's the best use of tax dollars. Thank you. Diana, the next question is yours for Mr. Cunningham. Okay. Uh, where do you stand on abortion laws, even for cases of rape and incest? Listen, I support a woman's right to choose under the law. 
of Roe v. Wade, and it's settled law, period. And I support a woman's right to choose under, obviously, rape or incest. And I think that we need to expand women's health care access. I think that's an issue here. My opponent protests outside Planned Parenthood with a bullhorn. That's where the women go in to get cancer screenings and testings. I think it's imperative we expand that access, keep the parts of the ACA that benefit women, open up their access to, to those cancer screenings and testing, and make sure they have the proper health care they need. That's what's important to me in protecting the law. So first and foremost, as a mother of a child born with special needs, I understand the sanctity of life and I am unequivocally and unapologetically supportive of life. I didn't stand outside Planned Parenthood in protest. I was praying. I was praying for the young women walking in there and the babies that would never see light of day. Whether Roe v. or Wade is there, my challenge is tax dollars should not be paying for abortions. That is something I cannot condone, and I will make no apologies for standing up for the sanctity of life. No life in this world, anyone's, is worth being murdered before you even have a chance to become a human being. So I'm sorry, late. I'm not sorry, I'm very proud of it. I would never support abortion. I would never support taxpayer-funded abortions as my opponent will. Tessa? A question to Representative Arrington. Okay, we've got another social media question. This one is from Rob on Twitter. And he says or asks, people are tired of not being heard by elected officials. What are you going to do to ensure the concerns of all your constituents are represented in Washington? So I've had experience in the State House, and you know, you can go to anybody in Somerville. I'm a very accessible person. Having good people around a congressman is important because the thing with Congress, they call it Potomac fever. Somehow or along the line, we, we're not the smartest person in the room until we get elected and then somehow they think that they are. I'm not that way. I look to my community because I wanna represent you. This is about service over self. This is about being the voice of the community, not the opinion. I make myself available. My cell phone is still the same cell phone number I've had. People call it, I pick it up every day. I'll be in district one week every month to meet with my Flood Solution Roundtable. I will be there to meet with my, com my act the, the community activists that need help in, in policy or legislation. This is a community effort, and I will always be ready, willing, and available to serve my community. Everyone should have a voice here in this district. Everyone should be represented. When, whenever my opponent stood on Yorktown and said the job of a Republican congressman is to fight for their team, that is simply excluding every single one else who may not be on the team. I think it's important to listen to your constituents. That's why we don't delete comments off of Facebook, unlike some people. We let everyone have a voice, and they'll continue to have a voice. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, my door will always be open. I am running to serve you, no one else. Christy, a question for Mr. Cunningham. Post and Courier released a story that showed both Volvo and BMW losing tens of millions of dollars due to the new Chinese tariffs. Do you support those tariffs? Absolutely not. Uh, we were in an event last week, and a gentleman came up to me named Jeremy, and he was telling me he works for a production company in town. And they were on a 24-7 production line. He was working nights and working weekends to save up money to put a down payment down for his home. After the tariffs, they cut back to 24-5, and he lost his weekend shifts, lost his overtime, lost his chance at American Dream. These tariffs... I agree with Congressman Sanford. These tariffs are taxes. And my opponent has been clear that she supports President Trump's policies. She will not stand up to them. That's on the record. You can go to JoeCunninghamFacts.com and check it out for yourself. She will not stand up for the low country when it's time to stand up to the president. And I will, and that's the key difference. So it was about the China tariffs, correct? Was that the question? So, ladies and gentlemen, no tariff is good. Tariffs are a tax. 
We need to have the same opportunity every nation on this planet has to promote and sell their goods free of tax. That's thing one. I do disagree with the president, but when I do, I don't bash him on Facebook, I don't go to the social media. I call him and I go to the Oval Office. Now let's take China. Let's really take China for a minute. Their goal is to undermine our, our way of life. They have a plan that they have been working on. We need to ensure that America is first. So let's take China's tariffs. We have been sending China $500 million a year. $500 million a year for the better part of 20 years. We have rebuilt their infrastructure. And what have they done for us? The president is working hard to negotiate the best tariffs for this country, but when they harm the community that I live in, that I represent, I will be sure to tell him and to work with him Time to make sure up. that I protect our community. Diana, question for Representative Arrington. Uh, there is a recent UN study that says that we have until the year 2030 to avoid unprecedented temperature rise if carbon emissions are not curbed. With this particular study, where do you stand on climate change? So I think everyone in this world can agree the climate is always changing. Where we're standing right now is under, under ice. It's constantly changing. Man's impact, I'm not a scientist, I can't tell you how much there is, but I know we are making an impact. But here in the United States, we work to take care of our communities. We offer incentives for companies to be LEED certified to reduce their carbon emissions. The problem is we have countries that are taking our money, like China, that do not. How do we get them to play the game and, and stay on the same playing field with us? I'm a person who is about figuring out how we can work together on this issue, because this planet is something we all share. So I will work tirelessly to ensure that my children's children get to play in the same waters that I play in with my grandchildren now. Climate change is real, and humans do have an impact. And I, and I said that during my primary, and I'll say it during the general election. And I believe that we need to start moving away from dirty energy and moving towards more clean, renewable energy resources. Solar power should be huge here in South Carolina. But these tariffs are impeding access to the market for solar panel manufacturers. The tariffs on steel, on aluminum, it's making it so inconsistent for people, and so we can't grasp a hold of that market because of these tariffs. I'm the only one up here who stands against these tariffs and who has voiced opposition for it. And it's important to state that when you go to Congress and work with other members, Republicans, Democrats, and independents, to make sure some common sense solutions can be put in place. This will be our last question tonight. It'll and, be for Tessa. Okay, and our last question comes from a social uh, media viewer. One viewer says, I would like to see the candidates talk about the issue of corporations having more say-so on policies than people do. How do you feel about that? For Joe, can I name starts? We have not taken one single dime in our coffers from special interest or PACs. My opponent has taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from special interest impacts. I think it's important that you have a say so. And that's who I'm running to represent. I'm running to represent the people of the low country. And so I can stand up to big oil. I can stand up to big pharma. I can stand up to the big corporations when I'm standing up for you. That is a key difference between these two campaigns. We have not <clears throat> taken a single dollar. My opponent has opened up her coffers and is flooding them with special, special interest money and PAC money. I think she needs to explain why she's taking money from payday lenders, why she's taking money from big oil, and why her campaign treasurer is a former lobbyist of BP oil. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. I would like to see the candidates talk about the issues of corporations having more say-so on policies than people do. How do you feel about that? As a small business owner, I, you know, that's we come out, we, we open a business, we take the risk. 
we want to hear from our employees. We want to make sure it's a team effort that we're working towards. So I think that there needs to be an open dialogue. Of course, we want to make sure that people have the best working conditions possible. Um, can we do more for benefits for their employees? There needs to be an open dialogue, of course. But when you're taking the risk and you own the company, you get to make the decisions. Um, but I, I need to hearken back to a couple of things that, that my opponent, as usual, you say about the bipartisan and he throws out a tax. My treasurer is a woman that I admire. She was a single mother, became a lawyer, and she happened to work for BP, and their job was to protect this environment. When it comes to money added in for this campaign, Joe Cunningham's taken his money directly from Nancy Pelosi and Maxine Waters. So who do you want running this country, running this district? Nancy Pelosi, Maxine Waters, and Cory Booker? Thank you. The order of the closing statements also determined by a random drawing prior to this debate. <clears throat> this closing statement will be one minute. We'll start with Joe Cunningham. And you can go to JoeCunninghamFacts.com to find out that is not true. Mm -hmm. I'll say the day after we announced our campaign for Congress, my wife announced to me that she is pregnant. And Boone right now is at home with a babysitter, and he's probably sleeping. And tomorrow morning, he's going to wake up. He's going to be eight months old, and his little eyes are going to pop open, and his fingers are going to start moving, and that's the gas in my tank. That's the fuel for my fire. That's what keeps me going every single day fighting for our country, because I know we're better than this. And one day, in the blink of an eye, he's going to be standing eye level with me, asking me what I did at this pivotal moment in our country's history, what I did to prevent the blind partisanship from strangling our democracy. And I want to tell him that I stood up for truth honesty, integrity. And I'm going to tell him the same thing that I'll tell you, which is politics will never change who I am as a person, but I want to use who I am as a person to change politics. Representative Arrington, thank one you. minute. Well, thank you all tonight, first of all, for, for listening to us and being interested. But I need to be very clear. The stakes are high, and we cannot get it wrong. With Joe Cunningham, you get Nancy Pelosi. With Joe Cunningham, you get higher taxes, less jobs, open borders. With Joe Cunningham, you get Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House, and you get Maxine Waters running committees in this country. We cannot afford to get it wrong. We need to send someone to Washington who's going to support President Trump's bold conservative agenda, the agenda of more jobs, less taxes, a secure nation, better education. That's what I'm going to Washington to do. But we need to have somebody who's going to lead by example. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to be donating two-thirds of my salary annually to charity in the 1st Congressional District every year I'm there. I'm term limiting myself to four, year, four terms, eight years, no more, and until military and federal employees have the same benefits as Congress, I am declining the medical and the pension for uh, congressmen. So lead by example. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. That concludes tonight's debate. We want to thank both of our candidates, Representative Katie Arrington, Joe Cunningham. We'd also like to thank our wonderful partners here tonight, Charleston Southern, as well as our three panelists, Professor Christy Gramling, Diana Snowgrove, and Tessa Spencer Adams. And thank you at home for joining us as well. And remember, three weeks from tonight, whoever you vote for, the most important decision come that day is to get out and vote. For ABC News 4, I'm Dean Stevens. Have a great night, everyone.